Hey everyone, back again. Today I'm going to talk about Michel Foucault's essay, What is Enlightenment? Now before jumping into that, if you want to follow me anywhere other than here, you can find me on Instagram at theory underscore and underscore philosophy or on Twitter at David Guineo. Uh, if you found this in YouTube form or on YouTube, you'll be able to find it in podcast form anywhere where you get podcasts where there shouldn't be any ads. If you found this in podcast form, you'll be able to find it on YouTube where I sometimes release uh, videos. Now, if you're new here, welcome. Hi, I'm David. I try to explain philosophical texts and ideas in a way that makes them accessible. So if you're new here, be sure to subscribe and you can see videos I release at least once, sometimes twice a week. Uh, and make sure to like, share, tell your friends. Who knows, they might get a real kick out of this. If you want to help me out monetarily, you can do that via Patreon or PayPal, but obviously no pressure. And yeah, let's just jump right into Michel Foucault's What is Enlightenment? Now, a few weeks ago I did, I guess a few months ago now, I don't know, it's been a while, uh, I did Immanuel Kant's What is Enlightenment? Now this is very much a response to Kant, but also a kind of modern rehashing of what Kant was on about in order to raise various problems that Foucault has with his own philosophy and with the other historical developments that would happen since Kant's time, because he wrote his text, Kant wrote his text, What is Enlightenment, at the end of the 18th century. So about 200 years before Foucault wrote this essay. So he begins by recounting the fact that Kant wrote his essay for a magazine at the time, which really, <laughs> it was this German periodical, really reveals the, the way that we've regressed in terms of what journalism is like or what uh, op-eds are like. But anyways, it was a, the question put out to the public was, what is enlightenment? In which Kant uh, submitted his answer. Now for more detail on that I'm going to go through uh, the key points that Foucault brings up here but I've covered that text itself on this channel as I've already kind of hinted at so you can go check that out if you want more background but you don't really need it like we're going to cover here what Foucault sees as being important. So for Kant enlightenment marked a departure from servitude from uh, kind of mental servitude or submission to authority so submission to uh, priests one of the other examples he gives is like dietitians to, to, to doctors, to people who claim to know things and that are the secret wielders of knowledge, of esoteric knowledge that only they can provide. So enlightenment is the emancipation from those specific esoteric sites of knowledge or from those sites of knowledge being the only uh, kind of containers of, of knowledge. So it is an individual effort for Kant, but that by virtue of its being enacted individually across, you know, across all of society becomes a kind of collective movement then. And of course he refers to this as, as mankind or as humankind, to which Foucault is curious what exactly does Kant mean here by humankind. And it is a very short text, it, he doesn't go into all the details about it, uh, and Kant couldn't himself actually explain all of these various things, it was just for a magazine. But Foucault is curious and he, he thinks it's quite suspect that we're discussing this in terms of a human revolution, so to speak, this movement into enlightenment, because that would necessarily mean then that everyone is a part of it, because it wouldn't be enlightenment if it's just a few people. Like that would be, that, that would just be a few people uh, demonstrating some superior capacity for something, at least in terms of the various uh, modes of power and knowledge that determine something as being greater than than any other. So it could mean for Foucault like this is, has to be a global thing or it's going to call into question the very act or the very idea of what humanity is altogether. Now Foucault doesn't really know because he's not in Kant's head but he's raising this problem here that he'll kind of come to show his own position on the matter as we go through here. Now another thing that Foucault adds that is found in Kant's text is that Enlightenment doesn't mean a total departure from authority. Rather, it is the submission to the proper authority that is arrived at through reason, knowing what is kind of proper uh, authority under which people can still enact reason to their full capacity. So it's a, not about getting rid of the capacity or getting rid of obeying, but just obeying while still retaining the capacity to think. So there's still that submission to authority to some extent. Now for Foucault, he points out, and I think this is really interesting, that Kant's piece was not just to question the emergence, the arrival of in the Enlightenment. It was also to apply his own, that is Kant's own, political philosophy to what was happening at the time. It was almost a way by which 
Kant could usher in what his political philosophy was hoping to realize to some extent, that is the demonstration of a kind of collective will framed around these individuals that had uh, a capacity to recognize their own moral capacity, their own capacity for um, knowledge. And for more on that, I've done the three critiques, the critique of pure reason, the critique of practical reason, and the critique of judgment on this channel, uh, which I will say, I treat the critique of practical reason and the critique of judgment much better than the first one, the critique of pure reason, but you'd probably still get something from it, and it'd be worth checking out if you want more about Kant's background uh, here and what Foucault is picking out about it. But just to kind of reiterate, Foucault is really highlighting the point that Kant seems to be try to, trying to realize his own political philosophy with this writing about what is the Enlightenment. Like he's almost trying to realize a situation in which his political philosophy will make the most sense. And Foucault says that this is a very interesting moment of philosophical insight because it muses on the possibility of a future, not for the sake of the future itself, but on the reflection of a or in motivating a reflective capacity, not only of the future, but of one's own stake within the future. Now, this is going to have implications in just a couple of moments when we are going to think about this in terms of modernity. But for now, let's, let's just put that on the back burner and keep that, keep that close in your mind because we're going to come back to it. So Foucault is like, honestly, this is the only value to be found in Kant's text because it's not like politically or historically rigorous at all. Like it's not really giving us much in that domain. Like the only thing that really seems to make it stand out is how it is applying its own uh, knowledge of history in a way that assumes this kind of capacity of of the human that that Kant firmly holds on to this capacity that we all have. So the way that this relates to modernity for Foucault is that in Kant's reflection upon the times with his own philosophy, he is demonstrating an, a, a disposition of the modern human. That is someone who reflects upon their own life. So there, we really need to be uh, laying more of a groundwork here to modernity. Foucault uses Baudelaire to think about modernity because Baudelaire gives us some kind of preliminary attributes of what modernity is that he then applies to Kant and Kant's own reflection upon the possibility of enlightenment with his own philosophy. So from Baudelaire that Foucault is picking out of, number one, modernity essentially disrupts temporality. It disrupts linearity. Whereas previously tradition, you know, was always looking to the past in order to determine the future. So there's a kind of straight line sequence I don't know if you're seeing this in reverse, but a kind of straight line sequence that's going to determine how events will unfold. Modernity creates a rupture in that because it starts to question things. It questions things like religion, like the family, like identity to some extent that will then problematize this linear sequence. And in that is the capacity or a new capacity to what Foucault calls to heroize the present, hero eyes the present, to lionize the present, so that we can find value not only in where we will be going or where we've come from, but in the moment, in the very immediate that we find ourselves in. So that puts us here into the second thing that Foucault takes from Baudelaire, that in this lionization of the present, we aren't kind of making it uh, sacred, we, which would then just be a recapitulation of the same kind of traditional framework. It instead is a way to find what he calls a kind of poetry of the present, to find a kind of beauty of the present within itself that we are very prepared might disappear at any moment, but that we can still find value in. Now, thirdly, it would be all too, we'd be all too quick if we were to say that modernity is then characterized by perpetual transformations. You know, this kind of idea of the, of the perpetual present, like we only look towards the, the now, which would necessarily then portend transformations all the time. No, what properly characterizes the present for Foucault that he's taken from Baudelaire is the capacity to perpetually reinvent yourself in accordance to the image of yourself that you envision. So it, it, this idea is being bound or this possibility is bound around the idea of who you are kind of um, homogeneously, 
how, how you want yourself to be and allowing for these transformations to better attain that self, to better realize yourself as human, which is, of course, Foucault's critical of it in his other texts, but still, it is a marker of modernity. And then fourthly, this plays itself out in a kind of aesthetic way, and it's for that reason that Baudelaire kind of attributes this to art, or locates within art this capacity. So these are a series of kind of dispositions, a kind of, sort of characteristics of what it means to be disposed towards or kind of geared towards enlightenment, not of what enlightenment is itself, but rather the attitudes that allow for enlightenment or point towards enlightenment or modernity. And its ethos is then a permanent critique or perpetual critique of our own historical period. Now this can be further kind of taxonomized, understood in the following ways, in either what he calls negatively or and, and positively, where negatively is kind of raising some problematic elements of it, not, not in like a negative way, but presenting some attributes about modernity that don't actually say anything about it per se, but that nevertheless still contribute to our understanding of it by saying what it is not, which is important to know, but that doesn't actually say what it is. So to engage with modernity and to engage with the enlightenment is to not either completely submit to it or to repudiate it or any of the kind of satellite institutions that form around it, that form this kind of constellation of effects called the called modernity or the enlightenment, like, for example, rationalism. Rather, we should be skeptical or worried about the crystallization of any of these institutions, any of these ideas into like a steady framework that is unchanging or that is unadaptable. And instead, then, we should be focused on the kind of historical conditions that make this possible, that kind of allow the formation not only of these dispositions towards enlightenment or that mark enlightenment, but these other institutions like rationalism or, or whatever ha you know, you'd like to introduce here, that can emerge, the conditions that allow these institutions to emerge. And he kind of adds this as an aside, he's like, well, someone could misconstrue this as being uh, a kind of project of finding the proper uh, you know, what it means to be properly human in this act of like constantly reinventing yourself. Now, Foucault wants to dissuade us from thinking that because he doesn't see modernity and humanism being congruent at all. Because uh, for him, enlightenment and modernity w were pretty steady. That is, they, they were quite homogenous, unchanging, whereas humanism was adapting all the time. So you had like scientific humanism, you had Christian humanism, you had Marxist humanism, and so on and so forth. So he doesn't want us to think about it in those terms at all. And this isn't to mention, of course, that the Enlightenment's pro process of kind of permanent critique is anathema to anything humanist, because humanist implies that there are these kind of key attributes of the human that can be unearthed with the right framework. So that's the kind of negative side, the negative approach to it. Now, the positive one is where he begins to, dis or he wants us to dissuade us from thinking about this in terms of a transcendental approach. Now, he's using this from Kant's philosophy, where in Kant's philosophy, and I've done an episode on what transcendental ide I idealism is, um, for Kant, a transcendental critique is concerned with the faculties that make reasoning possible, that make morality possible, and that make judgment possible, to be quite um, simple about it, which are universal. And there's really no getting around that. So Foucault doesn't want to do that. He wants to do an archaeological and genealogical excavation of the various institutions that give life to the situation we find ourselves in and that determine us as subjects in this world. Now, he, he doesn't want this to be just critique for the sake of critique, critique. Rather, he's pointing to the, or kind of encouraging us to use this as a roadmap to begin to experiment with the newness in order to try to make the world better as best as we can, which for him automatically implies a departure from what he calls global and radical efforts. And it's hard to think of this in or that he's you know criticizing anything other than Marxism here, but he's very much taking aim at Marxism as proposing this kind of grandiose uh, alternative to the situation we find ourselves in that doesn't get into the nitty-gritty of the various historical manifestations, institutions that make this situation possible. So with this new approach, we must be careful that we don't replicate the same uh, structures with this kind of experimentation that seeks to 
unearth these various capabilities and capacities of humans that have been maybe stifled by various institutions or disallowed. Uh, we, we have to be prepared not to replicate those same frameworks. Then he proposes what he calls a homogenization, which is to consider the technological and strategic elements of human interaction, where those are concerned with, the, uh, with what humans do and how they do what they do, that is with what uh, technologies they do what they do. So he's concerned here then with the ways that people interact with one another in accordance with power relations and the various motivations behind people doing the things that they do. Like why is it that people you know, wake up and go to work or act uh, the ways they do in, in work or at work or, or whatever. So this, these, these approaches, the technological and the, and the strategic, will reveal three other kinds of relations. That is the relations of people to other people of people to things, and of people to themselves, which will prompt these three questions in accordance with these three relations. How do people relate to themselves, that is, as, them, as themselves as subjects? How do we relate to one another and ourselves under these, these power relations? And how do we kind of relate to ourselves and are formed as moral subjects, that is, in having kind of an obligation to act in a certain way with certain people in accordance with what is right and wrong. How do these different, uh, these kinds of ways of living in the world come to be, and how are they dictated and determined by power relations? And it is only when we begin to consider these things that we can then really begin to interrogate the basic axiomatic assumptions that underlie the formation of these, this thing called the Enlightenment and how it is made uh, possible. And we can begin to question it by performing this kind of historical analysis of it. And that more or less covers what Foucault is on about here. If anyone has anything to add, I'd love to hear about it. You know, uh, comment below and I, I'll see it. And it'd be great. And people hopefully will comment on what you say. Uh, but yeah, if I did anything wrong, I'd love to hear about it. If you like what I did, like, share, subscribe, tell your friends. Who knows? They might get a kick of it, out of it. And yeah, catch you next time.